guys this is the real deal of Hollywood and today I have a very special guest the real deal of Hollywood <laughs> the living legend mr. Nicholas Custer thank Hello. you so much for your time and for coming to thank the you. show thank you the first question will be how you got involved in acting how you were how you uh, became interested in acting yeah your early beginnings. okay I was a musician in school in mm -hmm. high school and um, but in in at that time there was a lot of racism in LA as well as elsewhere and I defended a young Mexican kid who had been beaten up by a very um, politically fascistic kid. He'd, in fact the kid had paid somebody to beat him up so I went in to defend him. I wasn't very successful because the principal of the school was very right-wing but the public speaking teacher heard me. She said, come here, I'm going to put your big mouth to work. And she put me in a public speaking contest for a, a group called the Lions Club, which is a charitable organization here in the United States and the worldwide. So I won all these contests. Uh, and then at, at about that time, <coughs> excuse me, I was living in California. But my father was in England, uh, and he had been a, a, a war uh, hero, and he stayed in England, and I hadn't seen him since I was a little boy. So I went back to England to see my father, and he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an actor. He said, well, that, my father was a big critic before the war, and so he said, well, come and meet some actors. So I did. And they all told me I should try to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. So I went and I had a wonderful time, met lots of good people, learned something. And uh, my subsequent career was very much influenced by not only the teachers at the Royal Academy, but also the London Theatre and then subsequently the Broadway Theatre. and. Uh, and um, so uh, I, had, I came back from the Royal Academy as God's gift to Hollywood. And I couldn't get, as they say, they have an expression called, I couldn't get arrested, meaning nobody wanted me. <coughs> so I worked cooking hamburgers and this, that, and the other. And I did a couple of movies. Then I went in the army. And I, I was in the Presidential Guard in Washington, D.C. So I got to go to New York a lot and see a lot of good plays. And afterwards I became a, a New York theater actor. And also repertory. I, I was a founding member of the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, uh, the Baltimore Center Stage, the Charles Playhouse in Boston. So I did a lot of classical theater in repertory. And then I finally started working on Broadway with Laurence Olivier. I was hired to be his standby, meaning if he got sick, I would finish the show. And uh, so one night he got a little injured, but uh, he was very funny. And he said, he looked at me and he said, not tonight, Nicholas. And I said, why did you say that? He said, well, you know, the only time I ever ever missed a performance was when Albert Finney was my understudy and we all know the rest of that story. Yeah. Albert Finney went on for him in Coriolanus and was brilliant mm -hmm. and everybody it made Albert Finney's career mm -hmm. and uh, but he was great Olivier was great uh, Harold Pinter was great I I had a wonderful time in New York uh, on in the theater and then I got a divorce and I came west and uh, started doing a lot of movies. 
and some very good movies like All the President's Men uh, and some not so good movies. Uh, and then I went, I started going back to doing soap operas and I got Santa Barbara, which was very popular around the world, in France and in Russia, Germany and so forth. And that was terrific. Um, I just had a wonderful time and I brought up my children and, and um, yeah, so that's more or less it. Now, uh, it took me all this time to win what they call an Emmy, uh, the television award. Uh, but I started doing a, a show called The Bay on Amazon a couple of years ago. And we don't make any money, but it's fun and nice people. And I got an Emmy. So at my age, I finally got an Emmy. But you got many nominations when you were filming Santa oh, Barbara. Oh, in Santa Barbara, I got three or four of them, yeah. And I won other awards on Santa Barbara. But, uh, yeah, so... How was your experience filming Santa Barbara? As I believe one of the biggest projects which you have done. Well, it was fascinating because we had brilliant writers. Um, unfortunately, most of the soap operas I've done have not had brilliant writers. Um, but Santa Barbara was a, a joy. And we used to talk to the writers, which doesn't happen very often mm -hmm. on television. Um, and, um, you know, they were very um, knowledgeable and humorous. I think the thing that we brought to Santa Barbara more than any soap that I'd been on since another one back in the 70s uh, called Another World, um, we brought humor mm -hmm. and, and literacy. And we referred to things other than primitive. Uh, there was some intellectual <laughs> activity going on. Mm -hmm. And we reflected that and people liked it, you know, as well as having some of the most attractive people ever on television. <laughs> Do you still keep in touch with any of actors yeah. uh, of the crew of the Santa Yeah, uh, Judith McConnell, Jed, uh, Louise Sorrell, my darling, Augusta, still my very, very close friend. And uh, yeah, we think of Robin Matson. Um, a. Martinez. And, sorry? A. Martinez. Oh, A. Martinez, I adore. Now, I did a play in New York called Blood Knot back in the 60s with Louis Gossett, and mostly, and... Uh, a. Martinez did my role here in Malibu uh, mm -hmm. last year and uh, they both got up on stage opening night and brought me up with them and said, here's Nicholas Coster who played this role the whole time in New York. And uh, so that was, yeah, that was very exciting. That's a wonderful story. Do you still have any uh, like meetings with the crew, with the team, with actors from Santa Barbara? Oh yeah, absolutely. We have them on the boat. And uh, we have, once in a while, we have a Santa Barbara reunion. Mm -hmm. I don't know about this year, but on the 30th anniversary, we had a reunion. And, uh, then, when do you plan next reunion? I don't know, maybe 35, right? Yeah. So 84, 35 would be... 19. 19. Yeah. Hey! Next year. Next year. Yeah. Okay. You'll be there. We will, <laughs> if you invite us. Okay. You're invited already. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you are involved uh, in um, judging uh, Oscars yeah. uh, foreign films. Could you please tell us the behind, behind the scenes, how is it going over there? Oh, well, I call, I'm on the Foreign Language Film Committee at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which is awards the Oscars. And I've been on that committee for years and years. And we worked very hard. Uh, last year, my beautiful Russian wife and I saw 47 foreign films. The year before, we saw 52. So we work hard, and it's a joy. Because just joining thinking and communicating with these wonderful filmmakers from all over the world uh, is... Uh, is an experience I, I would not want to miss. And I think it affects my own work, mm -hmm. as does any art, when you allow yourself to be influenced by somebody else's fine art. It, it, you cannot help but grow yourself, even at my age. And um, 
So yeah, so we go, we drive from here, from the Marina del Rey, all the way to Hollywood or Beverly Hills to see these foreign films. And very often they have receptions as well, of the film companies, like last night Spike Lee had a lovely reception for his new movie, um, um, uh, uh, The Black Klansman, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great movie. It's, it's his best movie in decades. And, uh, and it was fun, a fun meeting him. He's a real good guy, you know, and very natural and, and uh, you know, not patronizing at all, smart mm -hmm. as he is. Uh, we saw a wonderful movie from uh, Norway, mm -hmm. which was written and directed by a young woman from Pakistan who was an immigrant to Norway. And it's one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen about a growth of a young woman mm -hmm. and, uh, and traditions clashing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, we learn. We learn not only intellectually and artistically, but politically. I think we get a little wiser watching these works of art. So that's what I get from them. Since you broke through and you got into the Hollywood industry and till today, what kind of difference, what is the change to, which you observe in the industry? Oh, lots of changes. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing, unfortunately, uh, all the money is going to the top. Uh, the salaries for actors are the same or less than they were in 1964. Need I say more? Well, wow. yeah, yeah. They uh, they pay all the money to the top. Uh, in 1964, the lead in a television show did not make nine hundred thousand dollars a week. Mm -hmm. uh, they made good money, and of course, when the show played in reruns a lot, they all became millionaires, multi-millionaires. Mm -hmm. But now it's just um, the difference between a distinguished actor playing a guest star is, is as I said, approximately the same money we got in 1964, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. There are some, however, in low-budget filming, mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity to act because of the inexpensive aspect of filming on digital instead of film. Mm -hmm. um, I've done tons of low budget films now and television shows. Uh, so that's good. That makes it possible for people to um, introduce themselves without it costing a million dollars. How is your experience with China? China is growing. The filming industry is growing. I am fascinated, and even in my terrible old age, I want to be a part of it. I really do. Uh, I said at the festival introduction the other day, oh, by the way, I'm honored to be a presenter at the awards this year. Mm -hmm. But I told them, and it wasn't political, uh, my favorite film ever is a Chinese film called Raise the Red Lantern. Oh yes, about that's a, a good film, yeah. Concubines and that whole mm -hmm. transition. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with the Chinese culture and tradition and I wish I had a better memory for language because I would certainly try to learn Mandarin. And maybe I will anyway. Tell me how to say hello. Ni hao. Ni hao. Yeah, perfect. See? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You ready to go to China? <laughs> but I still go. We have what they call the Actors Studio, mm -hmm. which was started way back with Stanislavski, and then the Group Theater in New York in the 30s, mm -hmm. and Ilya Kazan and Paul Newman and all these guys ran it during the 40s and 50s and 60s, and um, we still, I still go there. In fact, I'm going to take our host here on Friday as a visitor, hopefully. Uh, so I work, you know, because an actor is it's like a cello, you got to keep practicing. Exactly. And so, even at my age, I try to do stuff uh, periodically. Your three tips of success for beginning actors all around the world. Focus. Focus. Concentration. Remember your goal. 
Don't make your goal unrealistic. Just make your goal to be good, you know? I don't know, you know, some people are more clever at dealing with the politics of the film industry. But I learned to be a stage actor first. And there, really all that counts is if you're any good. And so, find a class, stay with it. Um, find some milieu in which you can practice your, cla your craft and continue to improve your whole life, hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you.